So this is a photo of me in college. Um, the thing in front of me is a robot, and it's not falling. Well, technically that's not true. That's, it's ironic. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, well, technically it is falling. Everything in this picture is falling. Uh, the plane is currently moving upwards while decelerating downwards. So everything's falling. Um, so I was a uh, as part of NASA initiative uh, for education. I was part of the Bond Comet program. I helped design this robot and got to uh, fly it. So we got to fly 30 parabolas of about 25 seconds of zero-g. And the reason they call it the Vomit Comet, well, they don't like that. They prefer the weight, the squander. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the reason they call it the Vomit Comet is not the, the 30 parabolas of 25 seconds of zero-g. It's the 30 pullouts of 1.8 g's. That's what it really gets me. Uh, but me being a uh, student at the time of the prestigious University of Madison, being of Wisconsin Madison, uh, known for some things, uh, including partying, um, I wasn't affected in my iron stuff. So. Anyway, a few years later, uh, this is me. I'm working for Orbitech on the outskirts of Madison, Wisconsin. And this picture is actually taken in uh, Bedford, Pennsylvania. I helped design, uh, build, and test this mining piece. Um, so as far as I know, it's the only on-fly variable geometry cutter head in the world. Um, and it's actually designed to mine on the moon. Pretty neat, huh? So uh, a couple of projects I worked on at Orbitech. Uh, by the way, if you think your uh, industry has a lot of acronyms, I ask you to refer to the aerospace industry. So this is the Low Energy Planetary Excavator, which is the mining machine I just talked about. The uh, Advanced Animal Habitat, which is a rat cage in space the um, plant research unit, the uh, humidity validation payload. Veggie, I don't think that's actually an acronym. Uh, I worked on the Bigelow Aerospace Sun Dancer uh, pressure relief system, pressure control system, which is very different, and the temperature humidity, temperature humidity and ventilation system. And I also worked uh, on a prototype of the rocket engine behind the Aquarius launch vehicle. Uh, so. Um, basically, when asked what I did, I got to say a number of things. I could say I'm an engineer, an aerospace engineer, I'm a lunar excavation engineer, I'm a life support engineer for a next generation space station, or I could say I'm a rocket scientist. And these, are, these are actually in a certain order. Um, for the majority of my time as an aerospace engineer, I was single. So uh, they're kind of in the order of likelihood of picking up a woman. The most likely is at the top, actually. <laughs> rocket science just seems a little over the top. <laughs> Regarding rocket science, a lot of people in our industry like to equate web development with rocket science. Um, I have the unique ability to speak professionally about both industries. would like to unequivocally say this is not true. <laughs> this is the Navier-Stokes equation. It describes how fluids are fluid. So on the top we've got unstable accelerations and then a bunch of other stuff. I stands for indicit, V stands for viscous. So there's the, the U vector, uh, we've got some indicit stuff. There's the internal energy at the bottom. We've got our viscous stuff with a bunch of shear stresses. Those are the tau's and some q's which represent uh, energy uh, addition. Here's our, tran uh, our axial shears and our transaxial shears. And then our heat addition, and at the end we've got our mass diffusion due to combustion. So this is what's happening inside of a rocket, uh, rocket engine. Um, this is not rocket science. <laughs> this is really cool, but it's not rocket science. This is tractable. Not your Stokes isn't usual. Anyway, this is a Ruby conference, right? A beer conference. meeting with Stephen Anderson for lunch for about the third time. We're talking about how the software industry was uh, quote unquote doing it wrong. Um, and he asked me if I wanted to start a business with him. 
And I said, I'll have to think about it. And so we went on our separate ways and uh, finished off our day jobs for the day. And then I called up my dad. I told my dad, this guy wants me to quit my dream job. And my dad said, maybe you should sleep on it. Who's heard of this, uh, this phrase before? Maybe you should sleep on it. Um, I thought that was hokum. Uh, that's bullshit right there. Um, turns out this is actually uh, pretty true. You should definitely do that when faced with uh, life-changing decisions. So I started to examine um, what was going on at my so-called dream job. Um, I would ask for random things from my boss, knowing that they would increase, increase my productivity and my coworkers' productivity. Um, you know, version control. We love version control. You know how we did version control in engineering? Oh, yes. Copying files. This is good times. So PR stands for pre-release. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, so what I, I had this dream job. And my timeline for the day kind of looked like this. I'd sleep, work, and then I'd either write code, drink, or play frisbee, or some combination thereof. Um, so uh, I realized, hey, maybe this isn't the, the dream job that I was thinking about. Um, so what I ended up doing was you know, starting this experiment called BendyWorks with Steve. Um, and I, I didn't really know it at the time, uh, but I did kind of implicitly jump in with the goal of, uh, much like Matt's, increasing programmer happiness. This is important to me because I'm leaving my dream job. Okay. We, we Rubius love this phrase. It means we can do very powerful things very simply. And that makes me happy. Um, so as a result of uh, kind of diving into this, I went on a journey. Um, this is kind of in the middle. That's, that's Arbitech. That's what I was working on. Yeah. So uh, after moonlighting for a, a few months, I quit this dream job. I quit this amazing job where I was making cool shit for space. So I went from the outskirts of uh, Madison, Wisconsin, all the way downtown, <laughs> where I began setting up the Ruby environment. Welcome to my talk. My name is Bradley Griziak, and Aaron so uh, eloquently avoided pronouncing my last name. <laughs> so uh, when I talk about the Ruby environment, I'm not talking about the environment that we're used to. Um, it's not the cool output we get when we type RBM info. Um, I know this is going to freak you guys a little bit out, uh, a, a bit out uh, but um, the things that go on outside of a computer, they're actually kind of important. Um, I don't know if you recognize that. But at the end of a week, uh, uh, Friday night, you could go home and, uh, and start complaining about how awful your weekend at work was. Man, that's terrible. I, I just got to unwind, right? Or you could uh, spend Friday night at the office, hacking away with your coworkers on some side project. Or heaven forbid, bring your kids into work on a Friday evening and teach them how to cope. Woo! Wouldn't that be cool? Anyway, so uh, when I was looking at the, uh, the Ruby environment, I saw three components to it. I'm gonna try to uh, change my audio. This is not working. So, um, I looked at this very expensive mic is not working out so well. So I looked at three components. I looked at the uh, outside, which is the easiest to discern but the hardest to change. Um, I looked at the inside, which is really quite easy to change. And then I looked at people and their hands. Now, before I get into those, I'm going to have a, a quick disclaimer um, slash caveat. Um, perhaps you're a, a lowly minion of the, uh, the many rungs of the corporate ladder, um, like my friend Aaron here at at and I thought you were going to be the one heck heckling me. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> yes. Um, or you're stuck in a, a three release. Um, who knows? But uh, what I'm offering here is a grab bag. Um, Take what you will and uh, try to apply it if uh, you're not entirely happy with where you're at. So basically use what you can. What we got to the outside. Who knows the three rules of real estate? Location, location, location. All right, who said that? All right, that guy. Robert, can you give that guy a beer ticket? Thank you. Way to be on the other side of the room. <laughs> location, location, location. Those are all the same rules. <laughs> you. 
here. It doesn't look very dry. <laughs> <laughs> Neither does this. So this is um, this is a picture of uh, the state capitol um, in Madison. This is taken from approximately the same distance from the capitol, except rotated about 180 degrees from where our office is. Um, so I can't exactly uh, suggest everyone relocate their uh, their office a block away from the state capitol. But what you can do is relocate um, into a population center. And if you're inside of a population center, you can't, you get all kinds of things for free. Uh, you get things like coffee shops. You get a bunch of coffee shops around us. You can have restaurants, which play a huge role later on in my talk. Um, you actually get design firms. Not too, uh, not as many, but you know, quite a few. That letter B up there, that's that's Swink. They're literally across the hall from us. Really nice synergies going on there. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's the bars. We have a lot of bars around our office. It's really nice. Um, we've got a bar below us, one floor down. And we have a brew pub that uh, has probably around 10 or 12 uh, beers that they're brewing at any given time. They're across the street. So it's important to have interesting businesses around you that are also enterable, usable. You could be in a business park. You could have a aerospace company a couple doors down. But really, does that, does that bring you joy day to day? Probably not. What could bring you joy day to day is the ability to go to a restaurant for lunch by walking there or out to work. Anyway, so those are some of the things that are outside of you. But if you're in a population center, you also get a bunch of activities outside. So in Madison, what we have is semi-weekly farmer's markets. Yes, semi-weekly, not bi-weekly. We have one on Wednesday and one on Saturday. I think they do that because they're making up for the cold months. Um, it's really nice. You just go outside and get some fresh fruits and vegetables and, and meats and cheeses. Good times. Um, we also have uh, Lunchtime Live. So every Tuesday around noon, a, a live band plays on the Capitol steps. Um, it's really kind of neat. You have all these kinds of events that happen inside of population centers. Um, but you have to seek it out. Okay. I didn't even know that this lunchtime live thing was going on until after we had moved into our, our office. So you got to look, look for what's available to you. Another important thing, to us at least, is uh, have some nice scenery. So we have Lake View. See it? That's our lake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can anyone not from Betty Works name that lake? No. Oh, not Mendota? Or is it? That's not. Uh, it's Mendota. not that great. Oh, I'm sorry, the answer is Lake Monona. Mendona. Not Mendota. Mendona. Mendona? All right. I was expecting to keep that beer ticket myself, but uh, watch you here. Now. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you don't have a lake, hey, mountains are cool. Try it. Try to locate there, but scenery in general, have that. It's nice to have. Um, one of the biggest problems, though, with uh, being in a population center is transportation, right? Um, it becomes much more expensive as you locate closer and closer to hubs of, of uh, activities. So you can um, look into alternative transportations. You might think I, as a co-owner of a rail shop, you know, I roll into work every day in my SLS. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, uh, the SLS isn't my computer. More to the point, I don't really have one. 90% <laughs> of the time, I'm actually riding uh, one of these two modes of transportation. The bus or the bike. Many works hands out uh, free bus passes for every employee to use however they want to. They don't even have to use it to go to work. You know, they might use it for weekend type stuff. Whatever, it's cheap. Way cheaper than buying a parking space. And frankly, it's much more green if you're into that kind of thing. That's intensity. Um, and if, uh, as a side note about bikes, if you're going to do bikes, if you're going to have employees that like to bike to work, um, I highly suggest you find some way to provide secure storage for those bikes. For us, we just haul our bikes into the office and send them. 
But uh, that's about all I've got for outside. But again, do what you can. You don't necessarily have the ability to move your office tomorrow. But uh, if you have the ability to uh, get some input into uh, the next decision of where the office is going to be, uh, consider some of these things. So next is the inside. This is the easiest category of the three to affect because, frankly, um, all you got to do is bring stuff in. So the question becomes, what, do, what does the Ruby environment look like when applied to the interior of an office? First thing they do is to embrace everyone's extracurriculars. We've got two developers who are pretty decent at Rubik's Cubes at Bennyworks. I happen to be one of them. The other guy, uh, he's really good at them. Uh, and he has a bunch of them that are not just cubes, they're, they're various other types of puzzles. So he brought them in. He can do all of those, except for the really big one in the center. He hasn't uh, found the time to do it. Apparently that one takes hours and hours to do, even if you know exactly what you're doing. <laughs> so uh, we're also fans of Lego, as you can see by the, the spaceship. Guess who's that is? <laughs> Um, another thing 